we're at a crossroad similar uh, to 1929 uh, after the Great Crash. Welcome to Pictay Meets. My name is Rosa San Giorgio. I'm leading the responsible investing effort for Pictay Wealth Management. And today we will be talking about impact investing and how we can reshape and drive real change in our economy. The climate crisis, social polarization, the worsening inequality, which the pandemic has obviously accelerated, are putting pressure on modern economics and public policy. Governments can't tackle this alone. Neither can the private sector, but together we can. Investors can provide capital and support and being part of the solution. As of 2018, sustainable investing assets were around $31 trillion. Unfortunately, the bulk of this is still in mitigating the risk with environmental, social and governance consideration. And less than 5% of the total is in the positive impact space. With that in mind, in this edition of Picte Meets, we are joined by Sir Ronald Cohen, a pioneer, a visionary. The Economist has defined him as a compassionate capitalist and now father of impact investing. As a young man with a couple of uh, business school colleagues, you founded Apex Parnas, one of the first British and European venture capital firms. 30 years uh, pass, uh, you provided capital to more than 500 startups and decided to retire from Apex. Which were the social issues that you were seeing as uh, a venture capitalist, as an investor, and were not able to tackle through the traditional venture capital system? So, Rosa, I was a child of the 60s, uh, flower power, the campaign for nuclear disarmament, uh, more specifically. And when I went into venture capital, I sensed that I was doing something that was socially useful. I was helping to create jobs at the time when Britain had millions of people unemployed. And I needed to make money because I knew that my parents uh, would need my help in their, in their retirement. So I found that venture capital was a way for me to do good and to do well in the words that we've become uh, familiar uh, uh, with using in, you know, in, the impact, uh, in the impact field. But I realized as the years went by that although I had given backing to people who came from modest backgrounds and made a lot of money, and enrich the people in their, in their firms and their communities, the gap between rich and poor was just getting bigger and bigger, which isn't what I had expected. And so when in 2000, when I was still leading APAX, uh, uh, I got a phone call from the British Treasury um, to look at the issue of poverty with a more entrepreneurial eye, I immediately said yes, and that set me on the path to impact investment, and uh, that path has led us today to the path of impact economies, which I describe in my book. And in, the, in your book, you write, capitalism is not answering to the need of our planet. And is impact investing uh, the way to address those needs? And what is impact investing? So, Rosa, we can all see that capitalism, which has helped us to take billions of people out of poverty and to increase the general level of, of, of prosperity, today creates such negative consequences that even governments can't cope with them. We can see uh, the climatic consequences, which are massive, and we can see the social consequences of uh, underpay, lack of diversity, uh, differences in uh, gender equity. And so something has to change in our system to bring companies and investors to deliver profit, but also positive impact on people and planet. And my thesis is that the world has actually been moving in the direction of adding impact to risk and return. And if you think that the new economic paradigm is risk-return impact, 
it begins to explain a lot of what we see between us. The whole world has cottoned on uh, to the need to measure impact in a transparent, consistent way. Then you realize that the world in shifting to this risk return impact paradigm is now tackling the issue of measuring the impacts of companies in a similar way to measuring their profit. In your last answer, um, you mentioned that uh, um, we, have, we need to have positive impact and um, returns. And this is extremely important because uh, this is at the base of the sustainability of impact investing, having positive social and environmental impact and competitive financial returns. Unfortunately, there are still some skeptics that believe that there is a trade-off between financial and social return. What would you tell to those skeptics? I, I believe, Rosa, as an investor, that optimizing risk return impact actually delivers better returns financially than optimizing risk return. And the reason is twofold. On the risk side, if you avoid the risk of regulation and of taxation because you're creating pollution or creating social issues, that obviously is a, an, an improvement in your risk profile. But also on the return side, when you begin to look at uh, business opportunities or investment opportunities through an impact lens as well as a profit and a risk lens, you discover new opportunities which are much greater uh, than those you would have discovered had you only look, looked at risk return. Now, Tesla is an example of this type of thinking. Uh, Elon Musk entered the automobile industry with the objective, not just of creating automobiles, but creating automobiles that do not deliver pollution in the way the combustion engine has done. And he has managed to shift the whole of the automobile industry in the direction of this positive impact while creating a company which is worth today five of his competitors put together. So for those two reasons, the reduction of risk and the greater market opportunity that it, it brings, risk return impact, in my view, will deliver better returns than risk return. There is a correlation already in financial markets in five or six different sectors between higher levels of environmental pollution and lower stock market valuations relative to competitors. So impact data has become price sensitive already. You mentioned Elon Musk. Uh, let's talk about the role of entrepreneurs. In your book, you say that there has never been a better time to start an impact business. Can you give us some examples of those that you see around, those incentives that can support impact businesses today? So I see three major forces coming together today to boost this whole impact investment uh, effort and lead us to impact economies. The first is a change in values, Rosa, which started off with young people not wanting to purchase Uh, the products of companies that are creating environmental or social harm uh, or to work for them uh, and then became uh, apparent uh, to investors who realized the implications for the profitability of the companies in which they invest and hence the huge ESG flows uh, that, uh, that we see today. That's one major force. The second is there are huge leaps in technology that enable us today to deliver impact globally in ways humanity could never contemplate. I'm thinking of artificial intelligence, machine learning, augmented reality, computing and the genome coming together, and so on. And the third is this technology enabling us through the use of big data to measure the impacts of individual companies and to monetize these impacts so that you can look at a company in terms of its profits, but also in terms of its operational impact, its employment impact, and its product impact 
on people and planet. These three forces create massive opportunities. We have been talking about impact initiatives and uh, entrepreneurs starting new ventures to create a positive impact. What about the transformation of existing activity? Uh, what, what do you think will happen to the world's biggest corporation in this transition to the impact capitalism? Will they slowly disappear? Is, there, is change possible? Is conversion to impact possible? So those, those who see the change and participate in it will thrive and those that don't will be left behind, exactly as happened with technology. And those who do will go to their shareholders' meetings with transition plans, which may well be voted on by shareholders. Uh, and those who don't are going to be under attack uh, from some of their shareholders. We're at a crossroad similar uh, to 1929 uh, after the Great Crash and the COVID-19 Great Crash I think is going to be followed by bold steps. I hope they're bold enough, but certainly by bold steps, uh, both by the Biden administration and the EU, in my view, and perhaps by several other countries. So we need around uh, between 30 and 40 trillion in the next 10 years to achieve the sustainable development goals. Um, it's feasible. Will, will we see inequality shrinking, natural resources regenerating? Are you optimist? I am an optimist for four decades. The environmental movement has tried to find solutions at the government level. And finally, we're coming to the conclusion the solutions have to be at a corporate level. The pollution is not created by governments. It's created by companies. Once you bring into, uh, you know, into everyone's uh, ambit the figures about the impacts of companies, you create a race to the top. Companies will strive to improve their impact performance because it improves the value of their company. So we're getting to that now. I hope that governments will be bold enough that the G7 and the G20 will pick up these subjects as um, uh, will the COP26, the subjects of impact, transparency and integrity, and bring us to the mandatory publication of impact-weighted accounts for companies. My own belief is this will happen within the next three to five years.